Tony, how are you, man? Um, hey, my man. Before, uh, toy boxers, uh, please welcome to Gobo Super Interview Show. This is Tony Fleece, comic artist, writer, and genuinely amazing dude. Um, you can check out his art. I uh, tagged a little bit of it in the ad for this yesterday. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk to Tony here for as long as uh, he will put up with our nonsense. And, yeah, so if you have questions or anything for him, please throw it up in the chat. So, um tony to get started man um i just want to say i've read stray dogs um i gotta say man it's it's a masterpiece like uh you you deserve all of the credit and and acclaim you're getting from that series it's just it's really something man i just wanted to tell you that uh firsthand i think i think this is the first time we've talked in a long time yeah we haven't talked i mean i get regular updates to you from lunar harpooner curtis uh, <laughs> but but I haven't I haven't spoken to you in person probably since uh, Denver Comic Con probably. And that's oh been wow! A couple of years ago. It's been years. It's been a few years yeah. for sure. But um, but Stray Dogs, man, great great stuff. So I first Thank thing you. I wanted to I wanted to ask um, what do you what do you got coming out for us in the future? I, I looked a little <clears> bit <throat> at um, Shopaholic. Um, but yeah, I know that time shopper. Kickstarter, time shopper. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. A year, your name on, uh, on face on Twitter yeah, got yeah. me all backed up. So, so tell us a little bit about that series. Uh, so time shopper is a book that we were working on before stray dogs actually. And it's just sort of, it's coming out after stray dogs cause the uh, scheduling and stuff, but it's a European format graphic novel. You know, those like the band SNA, like the nine by 12 hard covers that okay. they have in Europe. <clears throat> okay, and sure. It's, a, it's like a short sci-fi comedy graphic novel called Time Shopper, and it's about a guy that travels in time, and he's supposed to fix history's greatest disasters. Like, he's hired by a company to go travel in time and fix history's greatest messes. So, like, warn JFK, warn the Titanic about the iceberg, kill baby mm -hmm. Hitler, and then <laughs> when he gets back in time, just like you or I would, <laughs> Instead of doing the important stuff, he just gets distracted by how cheap stuff used to be. And, you know, like you get G.I. Joe's for $3 and 14 cents, or you can get, you know, Star Wars toys for 75 cents. Uh, and yep. so he just goes shopping in, in the past instead of, instead of doing anything helpful for mankind. That is, that is the absolute best premise for a, uh, for a comic or story I've ever heard. Cause that's so funny. I was just watching, um, I read that Stephen King book, eleven twenty two sixty three, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. and they made the show with James Franco, and that was like a huge mm -hmm. part of that. Was he goes back to the sixties, and that's the first thing he does is he goes and buys uh, like uh, a Mustang for seven hundred bucks, and then he buys a bunch of comic books, and like yeah, just and, right. and so uh, you'd like to think that yeah, you could prevent that, but no, literally it would be exactly what you said. That's a great that's a great premise, man. I love it. Yeah. So, it's, uh... It's on Kickstarter right now. Like we've got like ten more days or so uh, of the campaign, but basically, it's just twenty bucks and you get the book. Or like toy collector types like yourself, I think would be into. We put together, you know, like Kickstarter usually come with like you get like a sticker and a bookmark and stuff mm -hmm. like that. We put together all this stuff like uh, swag that he collected from the past while he's traveling around. So we like manufactured oh, wow. and made all this cool. Uh, there's like a set of 1993 primetime TV pogs, which are like, there's like a, you know, a Murphy Brown pog and a Fraser pog <laughs> and a NYPD blue pog. Um, and we made, he's, uh, he went and recorded a, a song with boys to men. And so there's like a single of Carl and boys to men. And there's also <laughs> like a, a Richard Nixon campaign button and, um, a Mickey Mantle rookie card. Um, and there were some higher tiers that came with like a action comics, number one that has Carl, the time shopper in it. And so like, we made a lot of cool sort of like time travel ephemera to go with it, which, uh, which was super fun and, and sort of let us be super creative after we had already finished making the comic. So it was like sort of a second, like a second story we got to tell just in the, the, Kickstarter part of it where we get to sort of make and create all kinds of new cool stuff. Me and the artist on the book. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask you, so while, while he's going back in time and he's buying this stuff, 
So I imagine, um, and maybe we got to read the book to find out. So are there consequences? Uh, does he cause like uh, weird paradoxes by taking things out of the past and bringing them to the future? A little bit. I mean, th yeah, there are paradoxes in the book, but it's more personal consequences than I didn't want to do like one of these uh, apocalyptic, you know, butterfly effect type stories where you change one thing and it ruins the whole world. Yeah. But uh I, I like the the idea more of just keeping it light, having it be a story about a guy uh, shopping in time and then having the, all the effects of it be stuff that sort of happened to him and the people close to him. And then there are, there are other things where you sort of zoom out and get like a, a, a view of what it's changed in the rest of the world too. But, but that's not, you know, like it doesn't, the plot doesn't go in the direction where he's just like, oh, I've destroyed the whole world. Now I got to go return all these, you know, these yeah. Ming bosses that I bought from the Ming dynasty. <laughs> You gotta go take uh, the Murphy Brown Pogs back. Yeah, yep. the the, the world is falling apart without those. <laughs> no, that sounds like that sounds great, Tony. I everybody, uh, we'll definitely link the Kickstarter here on Toy Box. So guys, go check it out. Go support Tony. It sounds like an amazing story. And like I said, if you ever if you have not read his work yet, I mean, I don't know how anybody has avoided Stray Dogs at this point. But um, yeah, definitely go check it out. Um, so the next thing I wanted to ask you about, so. You have, um, I know, like within your art, within your your draw your uh, your art that you create your uh, drawings, um, you have kind of a signature style. But I know that you've worked outside of that style in several other capacities. So, but um, I wanted to ask, like, what are what are your main inspirations as a as like a as a tactile artist? You know, not as a writer. If you want to talk about um, your writing inspirations too, that's fine though. <laughs> no, that's fine. As an artist, I was really inspired by. Um, like the image comics that were coming out when I was a when I was a teenager, I think everybody sort of tends to be inspired by the thing that really grabbed them. You know, like that's I mean, you have a whole show that's about nostalgia. You know, like yeah, exactly. There's a certain yeah. there's a certain age where you're at where something can really get its hooks into you. Um, and so I was really inspired by those, like the first wave of image guys, and then like the second wave, like the the cliffhanger, Joe Matarera, J. Scott Campbell, Humberto Ramos, like those guys. Um, but I also, at the same time as I was sort of mainlining that stuff, uh, you know, my family, I came from a large family and we were mm -hmm. like Disney kids. Like our, our parents were way into Disney and they sort of, uh, had us all way into Disney. And so all of the nineties Disney and all the nineties feature animated stuff, even like the Don Bluth stuff too. And, the, and like Balto and stuff like that. Um, so that's like a, a more simpler style than the image stuff was doing, but I, I was also way into that. So it was sort of like in between there, but yeah, I guess it, like a cross between those two things, like nineties, nineties, extreme yeah. over the top <laughs> comics and nineties, uh, like feature animation. Yeah. So, so kind of that extreme viscera meets like extreme soft edges. Yeah, and that, I mean, Stray Dogs <laughs> is sort of, like, the most c clear-cut example of that, where it's just, like, here's this thing that looks like one thing, but it's actually this other dark thing, you know. Yeah. So how would you, how would you kind of classify yourself as an artist, then? Because I know, and I know you didn't do the art on, on Stray Dogs, but I know the, um, I know that, like, your biggest gig forever was was my little pony i know that you uh, i don't know if you still work for them or what or whatnot but i know that like knowing you personally is that you kind of have this like more this darker sense this kind of more visceral self i mean so i mean how do you really you, classify yourself as an artist in that way you thought i was dark like is that a <laughs> <laughs> i read i read uh in my lifetime man yeah I, and i felt like I that was light i don't know <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> i mean um, it was. It caught me off guard for sure. <laughs> it, uh, it's, I guess, more adult sensibility, but that's just sort of also what I was, what I was reading at the time, and what I was sort of interested in at the time. Um, I have, like, as an artist, I, I think of myself as, uh, like, what my ideal would be is just to write and draw my own work all the time, um, and. Time Shopper and Stray Dogs are both books that I did with collaborators, and I'm going to do a, a few more books here with collaborators coming up, but um, all of it is hopefully just um, paving the way to that, to that I have enough of a readership that I can just do 
my own stuff and 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 not have to uh like the collaboration aspect of making comics is very rewarding but it's also um i don't know i guess it is rewarding because you're like somebody else is there to keep you moving all the time you know like you don't have to be as much of a self-starter as like if you're making your own thing you just have to be like all right well today i have to write this thing and then tomorrow i have to draw this thing and nobody asked for it and so you're you're not like under any sort of gun unless you like set up a, a publishing deal ahead of time or something yeah so um but yeah i have a, a lot of stories that i want to do just by myself and so okay. I'm, I'm hopefully aiming towards that eventually i don't know if that answered your question no, no, that actually, uh, that brings up a really good point, because I was going to ask, when you do these collaborations, do you feel like you compromise your vision a lot? Uh, no, I'm pretty uncompromising. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the the collaborators that I work with um, are also interested in having the best possible product. Um, and so we go back and forth and we, you know, make sure everything's perfect and also being in or, you know as close to perfect as, as we can but being in independent comics where um like image image comics is independent and uh, time shopper is just fully self-published so like every, like nobody else touches that but everything sort of goes through me uh on its way to the publisher so i'm sort of like a clearinghouse for files you know like inks oh, come yeah. in and I, <laughs> I send those to the colorist and then, you know, colors come in and I letter those and I send those to the you know, person okay. who's pre-pressed. So um, I always have chances to, you know, tweak something and not like the line art, but just like, you know, we need to move this over here and then I'll send that back to the artist or whatever. So, uh, yeah. no, I haven't been compromised. Yeah. So you kind of have force majeure over the whole project. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know I if mean... I'm full majeure, but I, I have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have my hands on it until it goes to the printer. And so I, no. uh, if anything is wrong when it, like I was just looking through, cause we're working on the follow-up to Stray Dogs right now. And I was looking at reference of how a certain door in the room looks and like mm -hmm. from page to page, the door switches sides, you know, like sometimes oh, the door yeah. knocks here, sometimes the door knocks here. And I was just like, oh, man, well, we missed one. You know, like that, that one got away from us. <laughs> I know <laughs> but, now that's, everyone's going to be looking for it now. Yeah, all the toy box, all the harpooners. <laughs> yeah, all the all the all the followers with us today. Yeah, you know, that's that's awesome. So, um, so switching gears a little bit, I know. So, I know um, you're a comic collector, but do you collect anything else? So, you know, I know this is our toy box group. I never, you're not much of a like a toy collector though, right? Um, sometimes, I, like I have all of the Kenner Star Wars figures. Oh, wow. Um, but they're not, like, carded or anything. But I just, yeah. I, like, I love Star Wars, and I love going to the Star Wars Celebration. And part of the fun of Star Wars Celebration is buying stuff. But <laughs> but you don't want to just only buy, like, the exclusives or whatever, because that, like, <clears throat> I would go to those and the exclusives. If you're only doing that, you just find yourself buying stuff that you didn't actually want. You're just like, oh, this exists. I should get it, right? right. I can only get it here. Mm -hmm. So... At a certain point, we started just getting the, the Kenner figures because they would have, you know, like dealers that were, you know, $3 a piece or, you know, three mm -hmm. for $15 or something. Um, and so we're just like, well, let's get all of them. And that was pretty, um, pretty easy up until the Ewoks and droids figures. And then the, oh, yeah. Um, the, what they call it, like the last 17. There's a last run of Star Wars figures that were after nobody cared anymore. Yeah, so impossible. Hard, hard to find. Yeah. yeah, but I got all of them. Except oh, wow. The, I, I didn't get the Vlix. The, you didn't get Vlix, okay. <laughs> I didn't get the was, Brazilian droids figure that only exists in, in Brazil. Yeah. No, and I, I don't know if you watched our last Lunar Harpoon episode. We saw uh, we saw a Vlix. There was a guy who had a carded Vlix at the convention, and he let me hold it, and I had to kind of... I was like, please please take this back from me before I get arrested for grand well, larceny. Well, for... What, do you, what do you want for it? Uh, 50 grand. Oof! Yeah, that, yeah, I'm never gonna have a Blix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah. I, like, I'm doing very well this year, so I thought maybe like he had a Blix number that I could handle, but that uh, yeah, no, no. And it was you. uh, it was it was AFA graded. Um, I think fifty. So um, I mean, it was like there was a chunk missing out of the back of it. Uh, not like terrible, but 
Um, yeah, it was it was definitely sun damage. Like, and he said that it's one of three known in existence still on card in any condition. And he bought it from um, Leonardo DiCaprio, is what he told me. Wait, say that again. So he he bought you his licks from uh, Leonardo. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry, uh -oh. I had did I lose audio? Hello. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. It's good old technology. Now, I was going to say, he bought his licks from uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, is what he told me. Look at we so lost like, four people just right. by talking about Star Wars toys. What happened? This is not a Star Wars center. I know, right? <laughs> um, no, and then... man, I, I honestly... I. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go... No, I was going to say, I, I think that, yeah, just the technical issues um, kind of keep kicking people in and out, because I keep getting the notifications on my side that they're coming in, back in. So, but I'm sorry to cut you off. What were you saying? Uh, oh, but then besides Star Wars toys, and so like the Kenner ones, and then I like the I don't do Black Series, just because uh, I'm a sort of a, a 3.75 purist. You know, like I feel like that's what Star Wars figures are supposed to be like. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess when people are like that about other things, I'm just like, quit being a weirdo. You know, but uh, that's my <laughs> nostalgia thing, right? Like that's my one. That's my one thing yeah. that I'm sort of uh, nostalgic about. Uh, but then other toys, uh, I'll get stuff, but not too much. And it'll just be like something will strike my fancy and I'll get it. Like I got this, uh, I got this Reagan from the Exorcist. Oh, uh, yeah. She the, comes uh, with like the switchable heads. Yeah. Yeah. The to Toonie Terrors. Yeah. Toonie Terrors. Yeah. And then yeah. I got NECA, this, NECA's Toonie Terrors. They're great. I got this Tiffany from Spawn. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know why at all. I have, you know what? I get, uh, I don't know what it is, but I like, like, girl action figures. I always okay. felt like I would get excited about, uh, I think just because when there was, like, G.I. Joe and Star Wars, there wasn't a ton of them. And I remember right. that Princess Leia, like, in the 90s when Star Wars figures came back, then Princess Leia was, like, the hardest one to find. Um, and so maybe that, like, in, like, in printed this chase, you know, like, oh, shit, they made, <laughs> they made a girl action figure. <laughs> you gotta get all the girls, yeah. Yeah. So, like, I have, you know, weird, like, I'm like a weird anime figure weirdo with just all these girls around, but uh, I got this yeah, Sokotano okay. bust. Yep. Yeah. And I like it because it's cartoon style. When they started putting out the, like, the Clone Wars stuff and they did the ones that were, like, uh, realistic looking, it bugged me because I was like, well, that's not what they look like. And then yeah. now that they have a realistic Ahsoka in The Mandalorian, there's these Ahsoka figures that look like a realistic person who's not what she looked, you know, it's just like. Yeah. I think that's the one I got. I got behind me on my black series shelf is the, uh, is the Mandalorian Ahsoka. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, I, no. I, I fuck with toys a little bit, but I, but more books and comics. I mean, let me see. I have. Yeah. That's, books. that's my, that's my overflow bookshelf. Yep. Now, I remember uh, Curtis told me uh, before when you couldn't find compendiums of uh, a full run comic series, you would like make your own. You'd get them bound on your own and, and kind of make mm -hmm. your own compendiums. Yeah, there's a few like when the book, when licensing's weird on the book or, you know, it's never going to get turned into a, uh, like a hardcover or a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. I put some together. Like I did that with uh, Alan Moore Supreme. Um, and Jack Kirby's oh. 2001 A Space Odyssey, like these ones where just like the rights are all weird, so they're never going to be anything. Um, yeah, I got a bunch of those. Let's see oh. if I got one I can grab. Oh, I got yeah, this yeah. one. We're talking about my uh, influences. I made this one that's like all of Joe Matarera's Marvel. Is it, is it backwards for you too? Yeah, yeah, it's okay though. Yeah, it's all his 90s Marvel like before Battle Chasers, like everything he did. Oh, wow. Marvel. So it's like this, all of like yeah. Apocalypse and the Deadpool miniseries and like all, the, all that stuff was sort of my favorite type of stuff. So yeah, I put stuff together like that. I, or I did when I had more time. Now I have a, just like a bag of books that I want to send off to get put together. Um, and I just don't have time to, yeah. to organize them and ship them out and do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you seem to be you seem to be pretty busy with the uh, with the comic side of the world. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, things things have been very uh, very hectic this year, but it's been good, you know, it's, it's working out. Hectic, hectic is good, definitely. So, um, so 
so working for um for image comics so that was uh with stray dogs and i, I think you've, you've been on a couple of their other properties haven't you uh well image is like a creator owned company so you never like you never get a che well i do get checks from image comics but like image doesn't hire you to do anything either you publish a book with them like it's your own book like stray dogs is for us or somebody else is publishing a book and they reach out to you to do work for them so like i've done like i did comics in a book called fire breather back in the day years and years ago that was an mm -hmm. image book and then i've done covers for a bunch of image books um and like short stories and stuff but the only time that i ever have to deal or like talk to image central is when it's on a book that's my own thing otherwise it's yeah like i said how i have my hands on the things until they go to print like that's what the other creators are doing too like it's all up to them to put the book together before it goes out okay so let me let me ask you then so with your um with your working with image have you had any interactions with uh with the godfather with todd <laughs> not really somebody who works at todd mcfarland um in arizona at, at todd mcfarland productions uh was a big fan of stray dogs and he wanted to talk about doing a stray dog spawn crossover uh and he he talked to, to todd about it and todd was just like i don't get it uh i was like <laughs> i was like yeah i don't get it either there's not you know magic or superheroes and stray dogs so i don't know how that how right. it really worked you know, spawn had been around he just would have you know killed that serial killer and you know <laughs> Right, yeah, I would have been a very quick from the play. ceiling with chains, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I did pitch, like, that. I remembered there was, uh, in, like, the early issues of Spawn, remember when he went and saw Wanda, but he turned into a white guy? Like, he, he yeah. used his powers to turn himself human again, but he turned into this, like, blonde-haired white guy. And yeah, when he that went was there, weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wanda, Wanda opened the door, and she was dressed, she was wearing the Julia Roberts dress from Pretty Woman, but she also had a dog with her, like this little ratty looking dog. And I was like, well, I would tell a story about that dog. So like, if you wanted to see if Todd wanted to just do a, a spawn dog story uh, and, and sort of trade off of this stray dog's success, I would yeah. be happy to do that. Just that yeah. dog getting the little spawn adventures. No, and I, we got a comment in the, uh, in the, in the chat here. It says, pretty good Todd impersonation. I was going to say that was, that was pretty spot on Todd, Todd McFarlane. But I, <laughs> so just, just him acknowledging your series existence, I, that would be enough for me, man. That's. <laughs> oh yeah. Pretty cool. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stuff like that that happens. Like Jim Valentino, like commented on some Facebook thing one day and was just like, oh, great book. You know, I was just like. Shadowhawk, <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm very excited about all that stuff. Uh, I'm, we're doing a thing with Image right now that uh, that I, I guess I can't really say what it is. It's their Christmas card, uh, and they hit us up about doing it, and I was just like, "What?" I was just excited we were gonna get a Christmas card. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Oh, coolest. so you, so you guys are you and your group are designing the actual image comics christmas card yeah that's mm. that's kind of a big deal yeah i mean for to a certain age group like like me or to a certain you know to a certain part of comics it's like oh shit this guy did the image christmas card i mean i don't know i whenever i would get a card like that from the publisher that i worked for i would always be like oh cool they got this person to do it or they got you know they use this property or whatever so yeah yeah, yeah. it's kind of neat and it and it just gives us another piece of straight dogs art for if we ever do like a you know, a big compendium thing or whatever. Yeah, yeah, a little little special feature, uh, like towards yeah. the back. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I think it's, I think it's great, you know. And I think it, the guys that are our age, people of this generation, Image was, I mean, it was such a cool story. It was the really like the first time like a group of independent guys decided to 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 go against the mainstream, and they did it. They pulled it off. They they found commercial success, you know, just based yeah, on the well, merits of their talent. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And that's sort of the, the, I don't think they went into it with any altruistic ideals, you know, like they were just like, we're getting, you know, the company's getting a big chunk of our money. We could probably get more of our money if we just did it ourselves. Um, but the, what resulted from it is that now there is this place in comics where you don't have to split rights with people and you don't have to, you know, uh, no, nobody that doesn't, make stray dogs is getting the stray dogs profits which is right. you know, 
Exactly. Yeah. You're. Yeah. There's not going to be a a Disney Plus stray dog show out of nowhere. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah no, we didn't hear about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, they, they don't invite us to the premiere. No, not so much, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Well, cool. Um, so the last thing I had on my list, um, I wanted to ask you about a uh, garage art studios. I saw you were talking a little bit on Twitter about that. And I looked at the names and um, I definitely recognize tone on there and a few other people. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So that is, it, it was actually started in a garage, which is next door to the house I live in now. Um, at the time I lived in, uh, in Hollywood, I'm in North Hollywood now. It's like six miles away. Um, but a, a buddy of mine hooked me up with Tone Rodriguez, uh, and I was friends with Chris Moreno, who worked in there too. And they they would just go in there and draw every day. And it was a time in my career, in my life, where I was just sort of floundering and trying to figure out how to be a freelance artist and how to mm -hmm. how to make a living at that. And I went over there and saw these guys just really hustling. And I was like, oh, I could hustle. And they had a desk for me, and they were like, oh, you could you know come in here if you're going to hustle, and you know like. At first it was free, you know, it was just like, you just come sit here and hang out and work for free. And then eventually we had to start paying for, uh, like electricity. And then, uh, after a while, Tone Rodriguez, who, who owned the house that the garage was in moved away. And so we rented a studio space of our own and brought some new people in. So it was, uh, Chris Burnham came and worked in there and Drew Johnson who drew, uh, Wonder Woman with Greg Rucka. He's drawn, uh, like Godzilla right now, uh, for legendary, um, uh, and, uh, uh Gus Vasquez came and worked in there. It's like a bunch of guys would come through and work. Um, and we just all sit there and hustle together and, and work. It was a real productive, uh, place uh, Dennis Culver who, who writes for DC now uh he, he came in there and worked too so we just had like a bunch of guys um yeah and then the pandemic came along and it didn't make sense to have uh, a studio space rented because we couldn't have at the early part of it we couldn't have like two people in there at the same time you yeah. know because people had kids or they had you know like <clears throat> so the people those of us that had like smaller families then the people that had larger families were sort of had like a tighter control on who they saw and who they didn't see and what, you know, like what sort of, uh, contact tracing, you know, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> who, yeah. who was, who was bringing strange germs around. So we shut it down and, uh, we, we basically put just a, a bunch of desks and all the stuff from there in a buddy's garage. Um, and so we're just waiting until, um, until the, the world comes back online and, Hopefully at that point, commercial real estate will be a little cheaper too. And maybe we can get a place for, <laughs> for like a, a little less, or, you know, if it's like anything else, they'll just, it'll still be just as expensive or more expensive. But for the past couple of years, like the back half of stray dogs and everything I've been working on now, I've just been doing from, from right here in my house in the, in the back of my house. Okay. So it's, it's more of a, um, kind of like, like a collective of artists rather than, cause I was thinking, I mean, is, is a uh, garage art studios ever going to like publish its own stuff or is it just kind of, yeah, no, it's, more yeah. Just a, it's a collective. It's sort of like a, we would do, um, we would get like corporate jobs or, or animation jobs or stuff where people would be like, Hey, can you put together a pitch for a comic or can you put together a comic for this dentist or what, you know, like uh kellogg's had us do like a tony the tiger origin so you know it was just like weird gigs that would come along and it was good to have a group of people all there that could just jam on it and knock stuff out and and, and be professional and get stuff done um, okay. so we would do stuff like that but all of our pub at the whole time we we're working there sometimes some of us would self-publish stuff um but the whole time we were working there we would just put uh put our stuff out through publishers and stuff like that it's just easier than having um having to do it through the studio and have somebody else do it yeah that makes sense yeah so yeah like a, a collective mindset i like that yeah i saw that um you have that listed on your website as a couple of the uh commercial projects you've done i think you, there's like some sports teams and some other brands and stuff on there yeah, so, yeah. i mean how, how do you feel about those gigs? Is it is there any amount of creativity that you can put into it, or is it pretty much like we want this and you have to kind of go by what they say? Um, it depends. I mean, sometimes it is just like 
grinding where you're just like, this is a talent that I have or a skill that something I know how to do. And so let me just switch it on and grind and get it done. Um, but then other times, you know, like you use those jobs as a opportunity to try out new things or like there's like coloring techniques that I've learned doing storyboards, which I did for years and years that I use in my regular work all the time now, just because it's like you try to find out a fast way to do something and then or you accidentally land on something really effective. Um, so at like every whenever I'm doing art, if it's for hire or if it's writing for hire or whatever, like I'm always sort of thinking of it as building towards whatever my uh i'm always just like well when people see what i'm you know what i'm doing with all this then they'll get it you know and i feel like stray dogs is the first sort of like oh i get it this is what yeah. this guy was putting together and and time chopper i think is another completely different branch of that but it's like oh this is who this guy is you know Hopefully. yeah no, I, and I think that if there's one thing I could say about your work is there's definitely pieces of yourself in it. You can, I think that you can tell reading that, you know, like your 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 love of, of pop culture definitely resonates through all of your work, and I think that's been that's been pretty apparent. So, I think that that's really cool. To do, it's harder to do that in Stray Dogs because they don't dogs don't know anything about pop culture. So there's it's like a whole five issues with no references. Uh, except for like when when we do the the horror covers, that would I was be like, like the covers, the covers outside though, yeah. of story reference for sure. But yeah, the, like the idea that these dogs don't know any of the, they don't know anything about the news or about entertainment or Star Wars or anything like that. It was not really a challenge, but it was different than you know than write, writing what I normally write, which is people that that sort of have the same interests as as me. Yeah. Well, and now Time Chopper, I mean, it's it's just going to be littered with pop culture references, right? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. He, he yeah. knows about all the stuff I know about, for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's, into the, he's into the same stuff I'm into. Right on, right on. Well, cool. Um, well, yeah, I don't want to uh, keep you a whole lot later. Um, so I'm, I'm looking um, – I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. So Toy Boxers, if you have anything for, uh, for Mr. Tony, definitely throw that up here while we still got him for the next few minutes. Also um, – yeah, I mean, you can also find Tony on um, all the major socials, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, is it TonyFleece.com, um, your, uh, yeah, your website? That's where, yep. you, that's where you can buy stuff. Um, StrayDogsComic.com, TimeShopperComic.com is where you can go to get to the Kickstarter. Um, and then there's more. So Time Shopper is the Kickstarter wraps up in like 10 days, and then there's more Stray Dogs coming out at the end of the year. Um, and I actually might. I'm trying to set up a like a release thing because it's right after Christmas, um, so I'll be in Colorado. So maybe we'll get to see each other. Um, oh yeah! At, at that, I'm gonna hopefully do a, a Colorado Springs release that's on the 29th of of January of December. Okay, um, yeah. So I'm thinking about doing a Springs and then see if I can set something up in Denver too. So I'll. Uh, I was gonna say if I'm you're looking if you're going. looking for shops, I got a I got a couple of connections, man. So hit me up. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's yeah. Talk. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, 29th, I was going to say, it's like, if you come in, if you come in January, I'll be in LA in January. So it's like, <laughs> we're going to like yeah. switch. But, End of um, December. So yeah, we should be all right. What are you doing in yeah. LA? Um, it's, uh, I think we're going to go to that Alter Ego Music Festival. Um, mm -hmm. My wife's, my wife's family all lives in LA. So um, oh, okay. yeah, like uh, they live in uh, Moore Park. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, it's sort of by Malibu-ish. I'm not like super familiar with that area, but yeah, no, definitely. I almost came and saw you um, the last time I was there. You were doing a signing, um, but it was like an hour and a half away from where we were, and so I was like, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to like steal my in-laws' car to drive across oh, all of California. That would really trip me out if I saw you in person. I know that was like. <laughs> I, I texted Curtis about it too. I'm like, I was like, should I just like go and like surprise your brother? He's like, dude, do it for sure. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, just to, the the timing didn't quite work out. But no, definitely. Um, I, every time I'm in LA, I'll hit you up for sure. Uh, I saw you well, and Curtis were uh, were back at Comic Con. Did that, was that last weekend? Yeah, that was. Um, no, that I it took me uh, it took me about a month and a half to edit the video. But yeah, it was. Um, God, uh, Springs Con was I think that uh, like the beginning of September. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was okay. It was really nice to be back at a, a con again. It was at the World Arena though, and it was like mm -hmm. 
uh, the lights were like recessed into the top of the arena. And so it was kind of dark. Like I felt like I was wandering around in like a literal basement. Like you ever seen that oh, Nicolas yeah. Cage? Yeah. You ever seen that Nicolas Cage movie, eight millimeter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember the scene when him and Joaquin Phoenix are like in the basement, like shopping for the snuff films. And there's like kind of the creepy dudes are sitting around and it's like a really eerie environment. That's kind of what that con felt like. Cool. That sounds I, know. I can't wait to watch this video. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very I... demoralizing to be at that show, I think. I've been at some shows where the lighting's bad, and it's you don't think it's going to bother you, but it is just like, oh, sucks. Why <laughs> they turn the lights on? Well, it's like, yeah, well, I mean, it's like after being in there for 16 straight hours, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I mean, is there, does the sun still exist? Is that a thing that we still get to experience? Uh, <clears throat> oh, man, I sorry about coughing, but, um, no, we, um, so Curtis isn't going to be joining me, but I'll be at um, Denver, uh, Denver Comic Con, or I guess it's called Fan Expo now. I'll be there next week. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw Tone is there, so I'm going to go say hi to him. But I was like, oh, man, you couldn't drag Tony along with you, huh? Yeah, no, we did a show together in Texas earlier this year. but And then we're going to, me and him are going to be at Bakersfield Con together. Uh, okay. I always like doing shows, shows with Tone. It's, it feels the most comfortable. When I have to do them on my own, I'm just, I mean, I'm comfortable with that too, because I've done so many, but the, like, being with my studio mates and sort of hanging out like that, especially since there's not a studio now, it feels nice, you know, you get yeah. to break balls and just, uh, you know, have somebody to commiserate with all weekend. No, it's true, you know, and this is like, this is going to be the second, I've only worked one Denver Comic Con by myself before as well, and it was like, it's eerie kind of being there and like, trying to like immerse yourself while staying professional and you don't really have somebody that you can BS with. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I end up like, I end up like Forrest Gumping, just the, the person whoever's close to me and just start talking randomly at them until they tell me to leave. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, sort of the, the downside of doing as many shows as I did was just that it gets like, uh, it turns into work instead of being like fun all the time, you know, like you're just like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to go, I finished work for the week or I got as much done as I could and now I'm going to go work all weekend. Um, but the upside of it was you would meet and make friends with people. And so even when I would go to shows by myself, I would always know like, Oh, so-and-so is going to be at this and we'll hang out. And, you know? So like, yeah, even if I didn't have like my, my home, my homeboys, uh, I would have somebody that I could just link up with and sort of that would be my, my weekend con buddy. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely get that as well. Yeah. You, you kind of, Find find people. Yeah, it's it's good networking if nothing else. You know, for for personal and professional standpoint. So yeah, yeah, a bunch of the people we're doing a lot of uh, covers for this final two issues of Stray Dogs we're working on right now, and a few of the people that are doing them are just people that I know from having done conventions with them and knowing them from from being out in the world. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, right on. Well, Tony, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight, man, taking time out of your schedule to, to come and sure, come and vibe with us for sure, you know, and then come hang out. I, I miss you, man. It's been it's been way too long since I've got to see you. Uh, yeah, hopefully so, we'll see you in December. Yeah, yeah, just said December 29th. I can definitely trek down to Springs for that. And then, yeah, if you're if you're looking for a place up in Denver, I got, I got a couple of buddies. Um, like, uh, I don't know, if, do you know Alsees uh, in Aurora? No. No, but I know that they do yeah, a lot with. I mean, uh, hit me up uh, back when we get back in the chat, and I'll, I'll I'll link up with these folks and see if somebody wants to do it. Trying to find yeah. whoever in Denver because we're gonna do like I'm gonna definitely go to Escape Velocity in the Springs because that's my shop. Like that was my shop growing up. But yep. I'm gonna try and do uh, uh, Muse too because like uh, I'm hopefully we'll, we'll set something up like at Muse because they were incredibly supportive of the book and just ordered a ton of them and sort of have, like built an audience for us there. So <clears throat> I'm not trying to do a sign over there and then find whoever in Denver is sort of that for Denver. Cause I know we sold a bunch of books in Denver too. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do, I'll do what I can, but yeah, we'll, we'll iron out the details for sure, man. But no, cool. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to see you, um, you know, be it in the mountains or on the coast, man, we'll definitely, uh, we'll link up. Um, so definitely check it out. Uh, Time Shopper, everybody go hit up the Kickstarter. Go If you haven't read Stray Dogs, it's available at most major comic stores. Uh, BuyStrayDogs.com. You can probably get it uh, on Image's website as well. It's basically everywhere. It's like the biggest book on the planet. It's it's huge. Like, seriously, go check it out. All right. Um, got, 
So, guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you, Toy Boxers, for joining us tonight. Um, I am Gobo. This was Gobo's super interview show. This is uh, my good friend, Tony Fleece. And um, we very much appreciate you guys. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so, for tomorrow.